Mr. Trump begins his presidency in an extraordinary split with the intelligence community, a split that only widened after they presented him with unsubstantiated oppo re research the Kremlin allegedly compiled, a file that quickly went public. Joining me here in Washington for an exclusive exit interview is the outgoing CIA director, John Brennan. And Mr. Brennan, welcome back to Fox News Sunday. Good morning, Chris. President-elect Trump has made it clear, as we've just discussed, that he believes that the intelligence community released, put out information about this unverified dossier in order to undercut him. Here's what he said at his press conference. I think it was uh, disgraceful, disgraceful, that the intelligence agencies allowed any information that turned out to be so false and fake out. I think it's a disgrace. And I say that, and I say that. And that's something that Nazi Germany would have done and did do. Mr. Brennan, your response. Well, I think as the Director of National Intelligence uh, said in his statement, uh, this is information that's been out there circulating for many months. So it's not a question of the intelligence community leaking or releasing this information. It was already out there. But, I but must it tell hadn't you been reported on, and one of the reasons it hadn't is because it hadn't been verified. And when you briefed the president on it, you collectively briefed the president on it, president-elect, that made it news. Well, nothing has been verified. It is unsubstantiated reporting that is out there that has been circulating in the private sector and with the media as well by a firm that pulled this information together. But what I do find outrageous is uh, equating an intelligence community with Nazi Germany. I do take great umbrage at that, and there is no basis for uh, Mr. Trump to point fingers at the intelligence community for leaking information that was already available publicly. But it wasn't available publicly. Various news organizations, if I may, various news organizations had it, but they weren't reporting it because it hadn't been verified. And, and this brings me to the real question, Director Brennan. Why on earth would the nation's intelligence spy chiefs brief President-elect Trump, in your first meeting collectively with him on this unverified information, first of all, it wasn't intelligence, it was rumors, and secondly, by briefing him on it, you made it a news event and therefore by gave news organizations an excuse to report it. Well, I think news organizations should not assume uh, what happened during that discussion with Mr. Trump. Well, it's been verified by the Director of National Intelligence that he was briefed on this information. Yes, bringing to the attention of the President-elect, as well as to the current President, that this information is circulating out there was a responsibility in the minds of the intelligence directors of the intelligence community to make sure that there was going to be no evaluation of it, but just making sure that the President-elect was aware that this was circulating. And but couldn't you have done it a, a, a bunch of better ways, for instance, at a staff level person, give it to a staff level person rather than the spy chiefs giving it to the president and well, the president Well, I think anybody who has read the reports uh, that are out there, I think there are some very salacious allegations in there, again, unsubstantiated, uh, that were circulating. And so making sure that the president-elect himself was aware of it, I think that was the extent of what it was that uh, the intelligence chiefs wanted to do. What a, one of the questions, though, is whether the intelligence community is going after or somehow is trying to undercut by selective leaks the new president-elect. Let, 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 me, let me just ask my question. Because former top intelligence officials have been bashing Mr. Trump for months, and I want to put a couple of these on the screen. Former acting CIA director Mike Morrell wrote, in the intelligence business, we would say Mr. Putin had recruited Mr. Trump as an unwitting agent of the Federal, Russian Federation. And then former CIA director Michael Hayden said he preferred a different term. That's the useful fool, some naive, manipulated by Moscow, secretly held in contempt, but whose blind support is happily accepted and exploited. Can you understand, given that, and given all these leaks that have been coming out for, for months, that why the president-elect would think the intelligence community had it in for him? Well, these are private citizens now who are speaking about the current political environment, about individuals. And so I'm not going to try to defend or explain what they said. But I can tell you that the intelligence community is prepared to support the president-elect and the incoming team, uh, as we have done throughout the course of our history. So there is no interest in undermining the uh, president-elect and the national security team that's coming in. It's our responsibility to make sure that they understand exactly the dangers that are on the world stage, so that as they decide on which policy courses they want to pursue, they have the full benefit of the expertise, the capability, the experience, and the intelligence that we have so that they can make the best decisions for this you, country. You said you were offended, and understandably so, by his comparison. 
comparison to Nazi Germany. What's the danger when a president-elect and an intelligence community are at such odds and there's such, at least in the part, apparently, the president-elect, such distrust? Well, there are many dangers. I think the world is watching now what Mr. Trump says and listening very carefully. If he doesn't have confidence in the intelligence community, what signal does that send to our partners and allies as well as our adversaries? So I think Mr. Trump has to be very disciplined in terms of what it is that he says publicly. He is going to be, in a few days' time, the most powerful person in the world in terms of sitting on top of the United States government. And I think he has to recognize that his words do have impact, uh, and they can have very positive impact, or they can be uh, undercutting of our national security. I want to end this part of the interview uh, with one more question, which is the same question I put to Vice President-elect Pence. Does the intelligence community have any information, I'm not talking about rumors, information about contacts between the Trump camp and uh, associates of the Kremlin about discussions during the campaign about hacking the Democrats? The intelligence community collects foreign intelligence on foreign parties, entities, or people. If in the course of our intelligence collection we pick up information related to U.S. persons or officials, which we refer to as incidental collection, we share that information with the appropriate authorities. In most instances, that's the FBI. Uh, and so if we did come into uh, contact with that type of information, it would have been shared with the FBI, and we would make sure that our intelligence committees then were aware of it as well. So is there such information? As I said, if we came into, uh, if we had that type of information, we would share it with the FBI. I, I mean, I, I just have said that's not a denial, sir. What I'm, well, I wouldn't confirm or deny something like that on your program as much as I respect you, Chris. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Uh, let's talk about some hot spots. Mr. Trump said in this weekend, as we just talked about in that Wall Street Journal interview, that he might lift sanctions on Russia if they start helping us. And here's what the president-elect said about relations with the Kremlin in his news conference. Take a look. If Putin likes Donald Trump, guess what, folks? That's called an asset, not a liability. Do you think that Mr. Trump understands the threat from Russia? I don't think he has a full an appreciation of Russian capabilities, Russians' intentions and actions that they are undertaking in many parts of the world. And that's what the obligation and responsibility in the community is. I very much hope that our relationship with Russia improves in the coming administration. Absolutely, because there are very important things we need to do, not just on counterterrorism, but trying to deal with political instability around the globe. But there is a fair amount of responsibility on Russia's part to uh, change their behavior, change their actions. And what we need to do is to make sure that Mr. Trump and uh, Vice President-elect uh, Mr. Pence understand exactly what it is that we know, what we have intelligence about, so that when they make those decisions, it will be, they will be informed decisions. Do, do, are you concerned when you hear Mr. Trump in that interview with the Wall Street Journal already talking about a situation where he might lift sanctions? Uh, I think he has to be uh, mindful that he does not yet, I think, have a full appreciation understanding of what the implications are of going down that road, uh, as well as making sure he understands what, what Russia what are, is doing. What are the implications of going down that road? Well, when we look at what's happening in Ukraine uh, and what's going on in Syria and what is happening in the cyber realm, I think Mr. Trump has to understand that uh, absolving Russia of uh, various actions that has taken in the past uh, number of years uh, is, a, uh, is a road that he, I think, needs to be very, very careful about uh, moving down. From your vantage point at Langley as the director of the CIA, what's the most immediate and pressing crisis? foreign? policy national security crisis that Mr. Trump will face? Oh, the problem is, or the challenge is, that he's going to face numerous ones immediately. You have the problems of uh, terrorism, clearly, the cyber challenge that we just start talking about in terms of our elections and other types of cyber uh, capabilities that other countries have. North Korea, increasing development of its nuclear and ballistic missile capability, instability that has racked the Middle East. Uh, there are so many issues that the new administration is going to have responsibility for on day one. And that's why we're trying to make sure that he and his team are fully briefed up on all of these issues. As you have heard, and I don't know if you're able to say this, but you're, you're five days from leaving office. Uh, what do you think of his plans, his prescriptions, what he's saying about these various trouble spots, crises, challenges around the world? Well, I, I, what I think Mr. Trump has to understand is that this is more than being about him. And it's about the United States and our national security. 
And he has to make sure that now that he's going to have the opportunity to do something for national security as opposed to talking and tweeting, he is going to have tremendous responsibility to make sure that U.S. national security interests are protected and are advanced. And so I am very much hoping that he has some very good people that he has pulled together. Jim Mattis, Mike Pompeo, John Kelly, uh, and others. I think they are the ones that uh, are going to be able to give him some wise counsel about what he needs to do and not be uh, um, very uh, spontaneous in his words and his actions. Spontaneity is not something that uh, protects national security interests. And so therefore, when he speaks or when he reacts, he has to make sure he understands that the implications and impact the United States could be profound. Again, it's more than just about Mr. Trump, and it's about the United States of America. Finally, you are ending eight years of service uh, as one of President Obama's top national security advisors, both in the White House and then also as CIA director. What, looking back on these eight years, what is your greatest source of pride and what is your biggest regret? The first source of pride being part of, part of an administration that really has tried to advance the interests of peace and stability around the world at a very challenging time. Uh, bringing bin Laden to justice, uh, being able to prevent a, a recurrence of a 9-11 attack here in the homeland. These were things that the administration and the government as a whole uh, really did some great work. Uh, regrets, uh, when I look at the situation in Syria, um, I think my heart and a lot of hearts bleed over what has happened to that beautiful country. And I, I regret that we were not able to find a way to arrest the growth of violence and bloodshed there. Uh, so that we could uh, make sure that Syria is going to have a future for the, at least the next generation of Syrians. And that's the one area that I'm very, uh, very uh, regretful about. Very briefly, it, it, is there a policy that you now believe, with hindsight, could have worked to stop the, the carnage and, and uh, interrupted the civil war? Well, we, 2020 hindsight is always, you know, quite clear. Um, looking back now over the last six years, uh, the way some developments happened, the growth of ISIL, ISIL was, didn't exist at the time. Uh, I think uh, a lot of countries, including the United States, could have been more aggressive uh, and proactive in terms of what we should have done to, uh, to prevent uh, the, the deterioration into uh, there's so much bloodshed in Syria. Director Brennan, thank you. Thanks for your time. And we want to thank you for your years of service to this country, sir. Thank you, Chris. Thank you very much.